Hey everybody, welcome to our latest webinar from National Council on Severe Autism. I am Jill Escher, I'm president of NCSA and I am your moderator today. This is the third in our mini series on financial planning. We had one session with Andrew Comoro, um, a financial planner based in Connecticut. He talked about um, public benefits and he talked about special needs trusts and other things. You might wanna watch that. We also had a webinar about CalABLE, um, talking more broadly also about ABLE accounts across the country. You might want to watch that. But today, um, we are talking to a very special nonprofit based in the Bay Area, where I am right now. And um, it's called Good Shepherd Fund. And um, as you will learn, um, they specialize in really overseeing uh, or providing oversight for care for adults with developmental disabilities um, when parents no longer can. So I welcome Stephanie Johnson, president of Person-Centered Services at Good Shepherd Fund, Vanessa Marino, a regional director at GSF, and Cameron Lindahl, the VP of Advancement. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Stephanie. Oh, quick uh, housekeeping. This is being recorded, everybody asked, so don't worry, we'll send you the link later today, most likely. And um, we will definitely encourage questions, put them in chat, put them in Q&A, and I will moderate those and um, we'll pitch those probably at the end. Okay, turning it over. Great, thank you, Jill. Welcome everyone. Thank you, National Council on Severe Autism for inviting us to present today and we'll go ahead and get started. So again, we've got Cameron, Vanessa, and then I'm Stephanie. Um, Next slide, please. So after parents are gone, building a circle of support, that's our topic for discussion today. And the good, the good news is um, the choice is up to you. So as you think about building your circle of support, consider planning early, that's key to a peace of mind, embrace flexibility in the changing dynamics of life, your plans, and then engage family, friends, community professionals. Um, the circle of support, again, is up to you. The more connections that you have, that your child, adult has, um, the better that they'll be able to accomplish their, goal, their goals and um, their life dreams. So next slide. All right, so family members or professional fiduciaries. Often when I talk to parents, uh, they're considering for different services if they should engage a family member to be that person or if they should consider a professional fiduciary. So just an overview of a professional fiduciary. Professional fiduciaries are people that provide critical services to seniors, to persons with disabilities, to children. They manage matters of a client's day-to-day -day activities, their health care, um, their housing, appointments, and also professional fiduciaries may offer financial management services such as bill payment um, and also estate management and investment management. So Professional fiduciaries cover a broad spectrum of services and professional fiduciaries include your trustees, um, professional conservators, guardians, care managers, those types of uh, professions. So next slide. Oh, no, but why? <laughs> why consider a professional fiduciary? Uh, what I hear most often when I'm talking with families who are asking about services is they're thinking about time. There just isn't enough of it. Um, there's Maybe there's a distance between that the family and the adult slash child they are planning for. Um, maybe they just want to maintain the, the child-parent relationship. Uh, they don't want to be the social worker. And certainly in all of our planning, no matter if it's a planning for a circle of support, um, we need to think about our incapacity and our death. So those are the top reasons why uh, parents I speak with are looking at professional fiduciary services. Next slide. 
So where do people go to find a professional fiduciary? And top of the list is referrals. I think uh, when we can talk with someone who has had experience with a specific uh, professional fiduciary providing a specific service, that that uh, really holds a high, high mark for someone you might want to check in with. Also, uh, professional fiduciaries, you can find them at conferences and education opportunities. So in between those wonderful learning sessions that we have at conferences and education opportunities, often there's an exhibitors hall. And so make sure to talk to the folks at the exhibitors hall. You'll talk with special needs planners, uh, attorneys who specialize in special needs planning, guardianships, conservatorships, trust, uh, professional fiduciaries themselves will be there. So that's a good, a good avenue to get more information about a professional fiduciary and the services they provide. Additionally, a person can look online. So a good organization to check out their website would be the National Guardianship Association. Also, there's Autism Speaks. Um, certainly, the National Council on Severe Autism has a lot of resources on their website. Most of these organizations have some type of membership directory online. So that directory usually lets you search by service type and location. Next slide. Okay, the big question, what is this gonna, what is this gonna cost? Um, Professional fiduciary expense. So really it depends on the type of engagement. For example, is this an engagement for a person service or is it a financial engagement? And what I've seen most is for engagement of services that requires face-to-face -face visits and care coordination, those services are often billed at an hourly rate. If it's a financial, service. Uh, usually it's a combination of a flat monthly rate and then a percentage of the investment. And one thing to make sure if you're talking with someone, a professional fiduciary about a financial service and they charge a flat monthly rate, you'll want to inquire about the scope of service included in that flat monthly rate and make sure there are no uh, additional fees that could be assessed for services that extend out of what they planned in that, that monthly rate. Um, professional fiduciaries are not generally hired by governments. However, sometimes uh, there will be an agreement for a purchase of service for fiduciaries, for fiduciary needs. Uh, I will say that usually I've seen the purchase of service in place for individuals where there isn't a, a natural system of support. And a lot of times the reason there's a decision to make that pur purchase of service and engage a professional fiduciary is because there's um, neglect or abuse happening and, and really they need to bring in a third party to make sure that the individual is advocated for and protected. And then the last thing is, um, this is a suggestion. So I know a lot of times people's wealth is tied up in their life. For example, uh, their home, you know, we need our home to live in for as long as we can, but we know that after we don't need that home to live in, um, it's an asset for us. So you might consider when talking to a professional fiduciary, if fees can be deferred with a concrete plan for future funding of a trust. And so that funding of a trust would then pay off the deferred fees for services. Next slide. Professional service resources. So um, it's pretty common that when you talk to professional fiduciaries, it's gonna be a fee for service. There are a few options uh, outside of a private arrangement for fiduciary services. And that includes the public guardian's office. So most states and or counties um, have some type of tax funded public guardian office that um, can provide no cost services or low cost services to people who need their 
their services. Um, also, you can check with state agencies on developmental disability services. Um, typically, these state agencies uh, really have a wraparound approach to providing services for their clients. So that's a great resource. And then you might look to nonprofit and charitable organizations. Maybe they have pro bono uh, offerings for fiduciary services. And then there are some volunteer guardianship programs, not a lot, uh, but they do exist. And so that's an avenue to explore. Next slide. All right, um, as you're thinking about your circle of support, uh, it's really important to consider creating a letter of intent, often referred to as an LOI. So this document is gonna be um, a cornerstone to communicating everything that you hold in your brain uh, for the, to meet the current needs of your special needs child and or adult um, and everything you hold in your brain for the future of that person too. The letter of intent is essentially a parent's diary for their special needs child. And it's a fluid document. It can be updated annually or as needed. There's no cost to um, author this document, keep it active, and it's uh, absolutely something you'll want to share with your circle of support, uh, both when you initiate it and then as you update it. In the next few slides, I'm going to go through different areas of the letter of intent. And this isn't, uh, these areas aren't concrete to a letter of intent. It's certainly what I like to see in a letter of intent. I feel like it really uh, helps me in planning for an individual. And you could add or you could take away any of these sections. So we want to make sure we have a family history of, in the letter of intent. And that includes a broad history of family, both immediate and extended. Um, please include any special family friends. Uh, you'll want to include service providers. If you've got agencies, working on behalf of your child, if um, you have a professional fiduciary engaged, all of, those, all of those people need to be included. Maybe not in the family history part, but definitely in the circle of support section. And in addition to including everybody, uh, you wanna make sure to include contact information for those people. And then include the capacity of engagement. So if you have a professional fiduciary who has been nominated as a successor guardian, then um, make sure that's included. That's important information for us. Next slide. Okay, medical history. This is often the most robust section in the letter of intent. In this section, you're gonna include doctors, therapists, facilities. Um, you wanna include a list of diagnosis, medications to include dosage information and histories of medical treatments. The next section is educational work and day programming goals. So in this section, you wanna include current enrollments and future goals for all, any of and all of education, work and day program. And make sure to include special interest and talents. That's important as we uh, plan for the future. Next slide. Uh, in the letter of intent, make a section about residential arrangements. Include both current, past, and future housing uh, arrangements. Uh, also, please include considerations in designing a place to call home. So I'll give you this example. I worked with a gentleman who was very capable of living independently, um, what was important in considering finding housing for this individual was that in order to control his pain, he roared. He didn't take pain medication. He chose to um, practice vocalizations to decrease the amount of pain in his body. And the roaring happened every morning for about two hours. And when finding a place for him to live, we had to make sure that he didn't share walls with people because the neighbors weren't too happy about the morning roaring routine. 
Uh, so that's something that you would want to include. And then also include social considerations. Uh, certainly, we want to help people plan for maximum life enjoyment. So include recreational likes and dislikes. Um, include social triggers if there are any. Next slide. And the last two sections in the letter of intent. Um, again, this is my what I like to see in a letter of intent, but it, it, it's it's a fluid document, whatever makes most, most sense in your planning. Um, you'll wanna include a typical day. So you'll wanna walk through a day in the life from a.m. to p.m., maybe even throughout the night. Um, you wanna include important aspects of routine and schedule. So for example, if someone is uh, resistant to wanting to take their medication for before they have breakfast, and that's an important thing for, for the circle of support to know. You know, maybe that person needs to go to respite care for a couple of days. And um, of course, we want to keep on the medication schedule. So we want to make sure that breakfast gets gets to the individual before their medications get to them. And then the last section is uh, one of my favorites is future goals. So this is a place where you can write expressions of love, hope, and desires for your child. Um, really put down what the best life for them in your mind will be. And I'll give you this example. I worked with a gentleman who had a terminal diagnosis, so he knew he was dying. And he contacted me to talk about uh, a special needs trust he was setting up and, and care management services. And so I asked him to complete a letter of intent. And when I got the letter of in intent back, it was uh, just so thoughtfully written. Um, in the future goals section, he just wanted me to know that um, he loved his, I don't know if I said this, but he was, he was setting up the special needs trust for his brother. He wanted me to know that he loved his brother very much. And he, he wanted his brother to know that um, things would be okay in life and uh, that he had done everything he could to help take care of him. So there are times when I'm working with that person now and uh, maybe they're not having such a good day. And I'm, I'm always happy to, to remind him how much his brother loved him and um, how he, he, he really put time and energy into making a, a plan that would take care of him for the rest of his life. So that's it. Uh, I'll go ahead and have Vanessa take over now. Vanessa's gonna talk about conservatorship, guardianship, care managers, and successor appointments. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you, Stephanie. Good morning, everyone. It's nice to be on here. Um, my name is Vanessa Marino. I am a regional director with Good Shepherd Fund. In this role, I carry a case out of my own, and I also oversee a group of staff that we call care managers that operate in the capacity of conservators or guardian and care managers. I'm going to talk a little bit about that role and how to move into successor conservatorship. So why consider a professional conservator or care manager? Let's talk about first what a conservator or guardian is. It's a legal relationship, right? The court has given you the authority to protect a person's legal, medical, and social interest. Um, whether you go with someone you know or a loved one or a professional, it you know it's what's best for your family. But what I would suggest looking for if you are going a professional route is, or why you would want to choose a professional route is, um, working within systems can get overwhelming, right? We've all had to make that call to social security for ourselves just to be hung up on 45 minutes after, or sometimes I call for someone and I get to someone just to learn that I have the wrong document, right? So working with government entities, regional centers, state and local agencies can get a little bit overwhelming for folks. Um, also, these things require time. And it depends on whether the person that you're looking to take on this role can dedicate the time that it needs. And, you know, because life happens, emergencies happen to us and to our loved ones. 
And also good things, right? We want to take a vacation. We want to celebrate something that requires maybe some time away from this role, or perhaps um, you have another person that you care for that requires some of your time also. I think also another thing to consider is that professionals, guardianship, guardians or care managers are equipped differently to handle emergency matters or different situations that may come up. They may have direct access to attorney for a quick question. They may have built relationships with other service providers such as nurses or um, therapists that they have quick and easy access to, to answer things that may come up, right? They're trained to triage and operate in emergency situations. And also they have resources that we might that you might not know about. So those are some things to consider um, when thinking whether you should go a professional route or not. What I would suggest you look for in these professionals is what are the services that they offer? Are they aligned with what your loved one needs? Do you need someone that's more fiscally minded? Do you need someone that is more um, extracurricular or social focus, depending on the abilities of your loved ones? Um, or do you need someone that can do it all, right? So look for what they're offering. See if the expense um, is something that you're comfortable with. And one of the things is, is there a connection? Is this entity going to be able to carry out your wishes or the wishes of your loved ones? in a matter that is within their role, but that also aligns with your family values or your family's culture, right? I have, I work with a family who is absolutely against artificial nutrition. And so um, they believe that for their family, it's best quality of life versus longevity of life. The client um, and their family both are able to express their wishes. And so the client, um, they have decided no artificial um, nutrition. So there have been times where the client will aspirate and they go into the hospital. And the first thing they say is, we got to put a tube in and you know, they give me all the medical reasons why. And although I understand them, I have to be the one to convey to them that this is not the familial wishes, nor is it the client's wishes. So someone that can stand firm in the things that you want when they're faced with adversity. Um, and also um, that will be able to engage directly with you and the person that they're gonna be caring for. So connection is a very important piece of this too. How to work together when a parent is still the conservator and you're looking for, or you found the successor, um, that you're going to appoint. Um, I would say the best way is to be flexible and adapt to change. There's no one like the direct uh, person in that role or who's ever in that role, right? Um, give that person time to get to know your family, be open-minded. They might come with resources or a lens that's different than yours. Um, and as your currently in that role, um, engage other people, grow your group, get to know others, even though um, they might be in a different realm of abilities as the person that you're caring for. For me, it's just always a blessing learning from other folks. I have clients with cerebral palsy that use communication devices that I've been able to adapt or get them to adapt to work with clients under the autism spectrum. And so things like that, that I would never have considered um, or probably even come across in, in one client's life that I can take from another client's life. So um, talk to others, learn other professionals and just keep coming to some of these um, networking or presentations. So there are two types of conservatorship. There's the general, which is a blanket. It's a blanket order. Uh, under this, you're in charge of a person's um, legal, medical, social protection. This, this appointment 
is done when a person's disability occurred after their 18th birthday or due, an, due to an injury or let's say something that came on later in life, such as Alzheimer's or dementia. Uh, and now because of these issues, this person now requires a higher level of supervision and um, a higher level of care. The limited conservatorship is for people whose disability began at birth or prior to their 18th, 18th birthday. These clients are typically regional center clients. Um, this allows for maximum independence because under the limited conservatorship, there's a set of seven powers. And depending on the person's ability is how those powers will be assigned to the conservator. So there's the powers to fix residents, access to records, manage legal contracts, marriage, medical, social, sexual, and education. So this is designed to allow for maximum, maximum independence. So there are appointments, for example, where I will not, or the chairman friend will not have the authority over um, medical because that person has a capacity and they wanna be involved in their medical life and they wanna make decisions on their behalf for medical. So they will, they still have that ability to do so uh, or social, sexual. I can't tell people who their friends are, who they can have a relationship with. So this is, this allows for the maximum independent. Same when we're talking about conservatorship of the estate, the general conservatorship is someone who manages all financial matters. Um, and the limited is only for someone who has assets outside of a special needs trust, such as an inheritance that they may have just come across, or if they received a settlement for an accident, this allows for bill payment and income collection. So the best relationships um, for successor conservators or guardians have all involved early involvement. And so the sooner that you can get someone some sort of information, the better. At a minimum, I would share with them maybe their annual plan or their individual program plan or IPP. If you get, you know, if you have quarterly meetings, send them quarterly reports, have them come once a year. Um, that way they can get to know um, your family and they don't have to start from scratch. Um, tell them what is the most important, what's most important to you or the individual um, and make sure that you start to build um, that connection or that there is one, right? That way um, you can make changes if need be. For example, before I started working with a family, I had to visit their home and then I just learned um, that the client hated applesauce. They, and the mom just said, oh, he hates applesauce. He hates applesauce. And I didn't think much of the applesauce, you know, and then later as I'm working with the client, he goes to the hospital and they have to do a swallow test. And they call me and say, he's not passing the swallow test. Um, we're going to have to um, do a feeding tube. And I said, well, let's go over what you're giving. What are you giving him? And they said, applesauce. And I said, no, no, he hates applesauce. There's no way that he's going to pass this test. Do you have any chocolate pudding? Do you have something else that you could use? And they, and sure enough, it was the applesauce that the client so very much hated. So little things like that. I mean, you don't have to write everything down, but just spending an hour with you and the family, like you just take so much from just being around them. And like I said, at a minimum, an IPP um, or an annual plan, those are full of information. Next side. Um, so care management services are not that different from conservatorship or guardianship services in the sense that they provide, we can do the same things. The difference is there's no uh, legal authority and care management services are voluntary. So you would have to engage a care manager. Um, these are tend to be more goal oriented and so what you want to look for is, are they able to offer the services that you need? So under the conservatorship, you're kind of overseeing everything that, it, that encompasses a person's life. But in this case, do you need help with uh, Social Security or do you need a public benefits analysis, um, housing? Do you need some housing services, educational, recreational? So these are going to be more goal oriented and they're going to last the span of whatever the goal is. 
um, what you're going to look for is do those services align with what you need? Is the expense something that you that works with you? And again, the connection piece, right? Are they going to work well with your um, loved ones? You know, I have cases where some of them just they've been through some trauma. They can't work with women. They we have to find a male or they prefer not to work with a male or just little things that they like and loud noises or someone that can be calming, someone that needs some more energetic person is look for the right connection. And thank you very much. And now I will hand it over to Cameron for trust administration. Hi, y'all. Uh, today's not going to be comprehensive by any stretch of the imagination, but we're going to just try to give you some basic information. So when you go in and you talk with some of these professionals, such as an attorney or somebody that's helping you do some Medicaid planning, that you, that you have a sense of direction. So I'm gonna jump right into it. And you know the big thing that is often faced with families is, do you appoint a family member or do you appoint a professional trustee? Now, I think right away, most families lean towards appointing a family member. And it's just important that you look into what the requirements are for that. Um, our organization is engaged quite frequently um, after those situations have already soured. So I just wanna encourage you to look at um, the Special Needs Alliance puts out a free handbook online. You can look up Special Needs Alliance uh, Trustee Handbook. And every year they even have it in Spanish as well as English. They publish a handbook on how to administer trusts like a special needs trust and what's required of that. I'd encourage you to take a look at that before deciding to appoint a family member to be a trustee. Um, a lot of the times the reason why someone uh, chooses a professional trustee is for these reasons. Um, one, they have expertise to protect eligibility. Oftentimes, uh, it's really a volume game to a certain extent that you have to see a lot of very different situations because no two cases are the same in order to figure out how the best way to administer that trust for somebody may be. Um, the second one is really the, the one that's probably closest to my heart because I so often get involved with cases where a sibling was appointed after the uh, passing of their parents had every intention of doing their best job and uh, made a mistake. Obviously, uh, you know, most of the time it's a very honest mistake that potentially impacted eligibility and then the relationship sours. And that's really the last thing we want, right? Especially when you're planning for your succession plan, you want your children or siblings or other family members to have a say in a very healthy and productive way. So appointing a professional trustee helps insulate that. And I'll talk about some ways you can keep them involved without having them be a part of the day-to-day. -day. Um, and again, that experience with administration. So it's not just Cameron, the administration. Can yes. Can you re repeat the name of that handbook, the conservators? Sure. Yeah, so it's called, it's uh, put out by the Special Needs Alliance. That's a group of attorneys. Um, and it is called their trustee handbook. So if you literally type in uh, Special Needs Alliance trustee handbook, it'll come right up in Google. Thank you. Go ahead. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, protecting government benefit el eligibility is only one piece of it. The other experience with administration is making sure that uh, you're well versed with investments, right? That you're well versed with something called fiduciary duty, which means that we want to make sure that every purchase makes sense long term, right? If they keep spending at this rate, is it going to last their whole life? Is maybe longevity not as important as Vanessa mentioned? Maybe quality of life now is more important, depending on. Uh, the sort of situation we're dealing with. Um, so, you know, I just encourage you that if you don't have um, a financial background, that you really look into how you would set this up or how your loved one may administer it if, if you're thinking about appointing a family trustee. Um, so, you know, when you're shopping professional trustees, there's a lot of options out there. Um, you know, my, my experience of helping families, you know, weed through this is to look at experience and size as one of your determining factors. You don't wanna pick somebody who's only been around for a short amount of time. You wanna pick someone who has been administering trust for many, many years, um, you know, and that they're a decent size. So some trustees like individual trustees may only have five, five trust, trust accounts. You know, I would look for a, a larger volume of accounts so you know they've seen those diverse experiences that'll help them care for your loved one. Also, if they're not a large size and don't have a lot of experience, they may not be around when it comes uh, time for, for eventually your passing, right? And I hate to be morbid, but I want to be direct with everyone that 
when you do pass, you want to make sure that that organization is going to be there. Um, the biggest thing, though, is compassionate customer service. So when you talk to them about how to access the funds, how do they deal with large or sensitive purchases like home modifications or vehicle purchases, I would ask them specifically what the process looks like. What are the timelines? Are there additional fees for phone support? Those are things that you want to ask to figure out, does that, does that fit the need uh, for your loved one? Um, it's always easier when we have a conservator, right? Because that person's advocating for them or a guardianship if you're in another state. Um, but, you know, those, those processes mean a lot uh, from a practical standpoint. Um, the last thing is, is very important. So there's a lot of trustees that'll advertise, hey, we only charge 1%. You know, we're, we're great because we're the cheapest. But in reality, they charge every, you know, they charge $150 an hour every time you call or they charge $25 every time they issue a check and you need to issue 30 checks a month. Well, I just urge you to, to make sure you clarify their fee schedule. Now that fee schedule may change. And you know, with all of this planning, whether we're talking about a conservatorship, a successor conservator, a trustee or a successor trustee, I encourage you to review this every year because you know, trustees fee schedules change too. So I often tell families, hey, you know, New Year's resolution, is just to make sure that you you reevaluate the plan that you put in place every you know first quarter of the year you know or something like that maybe another time of the year that is a little easier and less stressful for you for you maybe the holiday time isn't the best time for that um, so how do how do these trustees coordinate with a family or a conservator so one of the things that I, I that I often recommend is when you're putting together a trust for a loved one especially a special needs trust that you appoint somebody called the trust protector. Now, a trust protector can be defined in a wide variety of ways. Um, most commonly, they have the authority to remove and fire the trustee. That to me is a non-negotiable. I would make sure you have that anytime you're considering a trust protector. You wanna make sure that if that nonprofit changes in leadership or that professional corporate bank starts charging more money or whatever it may be, that they can appoint, they can remove that trustee and appoint someone who may be more suitable. Um, I would dis discourage you from having a trust protector have a lot of expansive power to approve disbursements. If you're appointing a professional trustee, let them do what they do best, which is the day-to-day -day administration. Um, maybe put, uh, have them approve something over a certain threshold. Maybe a purchase over a thousand, five thousand, or ten thousand dollars may be appropriate. But I'd let the trustee do the, do the day-to-day. -day. Something else about trust protectors. I would caution you against using a trust advisory committee. Um, this is often something that sounds like a great idea, but in practice can cost your loved one a lot of money. And that's because oftentimes a trust advisory committee is a group of folks, whether it's attorneys or loved ones or other professionals in the community that meet and supervise the trustee. Oftentimes one person can do that. And the problem with the trust advisory committee is it often slows down the process for your loved one and many of those professionals often have to be compensated hourly to provide that service. So again, I would encourage you to look at trust protectors and exactly how you want to define that before considering a trust advisory committee. Um, you know, a less formal appointment is an authorized representative. So most of our trusts say somebody didn't put together a trust protector. We're going to still want somebody to help us with, with a client that may be intellectually impaired in some way. And so that authorized representative is just someone we can communicate candidly with, we can share account information with. Um, so it's a less formal appointment and can change pretty easily. With a trust protector, that's written statically into that document. And we have to abide to the trust in order to change that if somebody resigns or something. Uh, letter of intent. This is something Stephanie talked about, and I cannot stress it enough. This is your number one tool when it comes to planning for those with a, when it comes to planning for your loved ones. This is the most helpful document that we have when administering a trust or when we're caring for somebody in a, in a conservatorship capacity. It lets us know the history and what your loved one uh, responds best to. What sort of family members do, can we rely on for an additional opinion when needed? What family members should we avoid, right? Or, or situations we should avoid. Um, you know, you cannot write too much into that letter of intent. And I would encourage you again to revisit that every year. I like the first of the year, but some families it's easier in the summer. Um, regardless, I would set a time every year that you go through and you review those. Um, so I just wanna briefly, I know we're running a little bit out of time here. I wanna just briefly touch on the type of trust 
And I have to kind of put on my disclaimer hat here that by no means is this exhaustive and by no means am I trying to give you advice on what to use. Every situation is unique and it takes a one-on-one -on -one conversation to pick the most appropriate type of trust and in uh, conservatorship, successor conservatorship, all of that really takes one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone with a lot of experience in this. So this is just to help you kind of point you in the right direction. You can do some of your research on your own before you go in and you meet with that attorney or that potential uh, fiduciary. So the first type is a, is a third party special needs trust. Third party means that that is your money. So if I'm establishing a trust for my uh, disabled son, it is my money and I'm creating a trust that's gonna exercise my will over that money forever, okay? That's really the intent of it. And what's nice about that is because it's my, my money, Medicaid or Medi-Cal, if you live in California, has no right to recover on my money for my, for my child. Um, but it has to be set up beforehand. If it's not set up beforehand, when your loved one passes, and again, I'm sorry to bring, be more, but I just have to be direct with you to make sure you get the information, that when your loved one passes, Medicaid has a right to claw back at their estate. What I like about a third party special needs trust, especially if you have more than one child with impairments, is it allows you to leave any money remaining to other members of the family or other heirs. Um, but it's gotta be set up beforehand. You don't have to necessarily draft a trust, but you have to say that it's to go into a trust for that loved one. Um, now, a first party special needs trust, this comes up more when there's an a unplanned inheritance or God forbid, a settlement from some sort of negligence or something, and it's not somebody else's money. It's titled to that individual. In other words, say my disabled son, for an example, which I, I don't have. I'm just using as an example. The point is, is that Medicaid has a right to recover on those funds in a first party special needs trust. Um, so, you know, it's just a, a very important thing to know that Medicaid has a right to recover on everyone's estate, regardless whether it's in a, in a trust or not. And if you want a trust that preserves benefits, we have to respect that state and federal law. Um, so again, this is probably the number one tool here is a third party special needs trust. First party, if you don't think about it or something comes up unplanned, can solve the issue. But third party special needs trust is probably the best financial tool in your wheelhouse if your loved one is on Medicaid and Social Security income. Something else that comes up, some of our loved ones do not need government benefits, or maybe they don't need government benefits now, but we worry that as they age that they may. Um, so oftentimes the sort of standard trust is called a uh, third party HEMS standard trust. If you walk into any trust attorney's office and you mention a HEMS standard trust, they'll know exactly what you're talking about. Essentially what this means is that the trust is to be used only for their sole benefit. It doesn't have to protect government benefits, but you can still impose your will on how that money is spent to a certain extent. So, um, you know, oftentimes when you're interviewing trustees, I, I would make sure that they ask you about a letter of intent uh, if you're setting up a trust like this, because you want to know that this money isn't just going to be for their sole benefit. You want to make sure that it's spent in the way that's best, that best serves your loved one. Um, so just some things to think about, you know, remember you have a special needs trust that preserves eligibility, whether that's first or third party, and then you have a HEMS trust that's really there just to support your loved one and is not worried about government benefits. Oftentimes these HEMS trusts, oftentimes these HEMS trusts can disperse cash as well. So if autonomy is a very big deal and your loved one is probably working a part-time or even full-time job, and you wanna just give them a monthly allowance, it's normally gonna be through this HEMS trust, but just be aware, you're not gonna be able to preserve SSI income and you probably won't be able to impact, uh, won't be able to protect Medicaid depending on the state you're in. So let's talk about a little bit of tax implications. Again, I'm not a CPA, I'm not an attorney. So this is something you really wanna sit down and talk with that professional about, but I wanna give you at least a point in the right direction. So when you go in, you know a little something what to ask, right? And you can do some, some research on your own. The first thing to talk about is there generally a pooled trust is going to be grantor based. That's what you want. And essentially what that means is that the, the, um, it's the interest and dividends taxed are not taxed at a, at a standalone trust rate. They're taxed to the individual. So if your loved one is on a fixed income, that's ideal because um, they're gonna, their tax liability is going to be low already. And this small amount of investment income that's coming in from the trust it, it, the tax liability should be much lower. In contrast, you have standalone trusts, which are taxed at a separate rate. And right now, uh, and again, this, this can change, right, with every new administration in, in office, but 
Right now, a standalone trust rate is generally higher. It's more condensed. With interest and dividends earned, the percentages go up much quicker based on how much they're earning on that. Um, in contrast, though, a pooled trust may not earn as much in investments because their investment portfolio is really designed for a whole group of people, often hundreds, where a standalone trust, maybe they could take more risk because it's tailored to your individual or your loved one. Just some things to talk about. Tax implications are a big deal. You want to make, make sure that you consider them. When it comes to a third party trust, however, right, if you're setting up a trust beforehand and you've had time to plan for this, that's great. There's some great tax advantages there. The money can grow and it's tax-free growth, essentially. Then the most third-party trusts, they're set up in the tax code as a complex trust is what they call them. And generally, they're only taxed on the distributed income. So that distributed income gets tacked on to the, um, essentially the earnings that your loved one is receiving. And so it allows you to get a little more growth without having as much consequence as those first party trusts when we're talking about pooled grantor and standalone trusts. Again, just enough to get you started so you can start doing some Googling and you know what to ask when you walk in and talk with your attorney or CPA. All right, so that, that concludes our session. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we wanna give a chance to, to answer any questions. And so Vanessa and Stefan, you're gonna jump back on and join me to answer any questions we have in the, uh, the chat here. So please feel free to, to put it in here. Um, so I'll, since we just talked about trust, um, I'll really quickly address the one from Dennis. Um, are we talking about third party or first party trust? So uh, again, within special needs trust, there's first and third party. Within HEM standards trust, there's first and third party. Uh, something you wanna talk more with your attorney about, about what fits your situation best. Um, I think we have a great one for you, Stephanie. When is the best time to engage a fiduciary? Oh, you're muted. I talked to a lot of parents um, and they're really future planning. So I think as early as possible is a good time to start talking to a professional fiduciary about what you might, what services you might need from them in the future. Uh, Again, when I talk to parents, their future planning, you know, decades down the line. Um, and it's it's good to have that relationship started. Uh, we might check in one time a year. I get their updated letter of intent, um, know if things have changed. And um, if there were something unfortunate to happen where I had to step in and, and, and go ahead and provide start providing services uh, sooner than anticipated, I'd have a good background. So I would suggest talking to fiduciaries as soon as, as you can, as soon as you're ready to, to start giving out the information about what you hope for the future. I have a question related to that. Um, in my experience, most people don't engage a fiduciary while they're of sound mind and body. Right. So maybe, you know, when I'm 80 years old or whatever and decrepit, that maybe I'll start thinking about it. But right now, it's probably not something I would do because I'm capable of managing my, ch my children's affairs, kind of. Um, but the question comes up, you're writing your will, you're writing your family trust, you're writing you know, documents. How do you legally appoint a professional fiduciary say like, okay, if I get hit by a, by a bus, right? I want Stephanie, right? Or, or somebody to do that. How, how do you do that? What language do people put in their wills, their trusts, other documents in order to um, point the executor or the, the court, whoever's in charge in your direction or a similar organization? When I've seen people know in their estate planning documents, um, the engagement of a professional fiduciary, whether it be in a care management capacity um, or maybe a successor appointment for conservatorship or guardianship or trustee. Uh, typically it's really straightforward, you know, in, in my incapacity or death, I'd like to name this entity or this person as the successor or X, Y, and Z. It's, I think what can be uh, more unsettling and you'll wanna un uh, talk to your attorney and I'm sure it varies from state to state 
is how to make, to be certain that your wishes for a successor appointment in conservatorship or guardianship um, are respected. And, and why it can be more difficult is because anytime you're, anytime there's a, a new appointment for a conservatorship or a guardianship, it has to go through the court. So you can say that you want Aunt Gina to be the successor conservator or guardian. And you guys had the discussion 20 years ago and it's in your documents. However, uh, when it's time for Aunt Gina to be that successor, it's still gonna have to go through the court because the court's gonna have to determine that, that, that that's an appropriate appointment. And who knows, maybe Aunt Gina in the last 20 years wrote a bunch of bad checks, right? And never disclosed that information to you. So those are the types of things that the court's gonna sift through in, in a, appointing a successor. Now, a way to get around that is if you enter into a- Yeah, but for like a successor trustee, you don't, you don't need court approval, for example. Cameron, no, I mean, I think people just normally write it in their trust document who the successor is and then, the successors contacted and they either can agree to take the appointment or decline to take the appointment. Yeah, it's kind of dangerous to answer questions like this on a national stage because of the state by state differences, right? But broadly speaking, a, a successor conservator or trustee would be within the successor conservator as, as Stephanie mentioned would be or guardian would be within the will generally. With a, with a trust, a successor trustee would generally be named within a trust instrument. And so in California in particular, we use a lot of revocable trusts, right? Which would have that language, some of which can require court approval. It's usually rare to do that. Uh, it's usually just a sign off from the last trustee or the other beneficiaries, but it, it, can, it can occur. Great. Um, we have a couple questions here about uh, supported decision-making. There's a big push uh, throughout the country and uh, a recent one here in California with AB 1663 to introduce supported decision-making as a legal construct and alternative to conservatorship. Um, I should say that uh, National Council on Severe Autism opposed AB 1663. It was an incredibly intrusive and broad bill that was really unwarranted. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure what the status is now. I know it was pared back somewhat um, I don't know if that has been something that you've had to deal with, with, you know, uh, clients who use supported decision-making as opposed to conservatorship. Um, I put it out there. Well, I think we need a whole nother session, right, Stephanie? <laughs> I think so. Uh, I know Vanessa, Vanessa is in the field and, and is a representative that engages with, um, in California, the regional system, regional center system. Um, and there is a push to move towards supported decision-making for our, our client group that hasn't been the right decision. Uh, it's certainly, I've set in on the training for supported decision-making in our state, and it's really complex. I can see how there could be pros to that, I can also see how it, there could be cons. Um, I agree with Cameron. This that that's an entire session probably to, to sift through that. Vanessa, did you have anything you wanted to add? Um, your experience. I have yet found an appropriate uh, scenario a scenario where it would be appropriate for one of my clients. So I typically opt out. In my opinion. Um, I think it's for really high functioning individuals because it can get complex. And, and I found that sometimes the way that it's presented is not like they'll say, it's totally up to you. <laughs> it's tailored by you, but like, gosh, that can get so complex because what it really ends up being is you're your own social worker. <laughs> and so unless, you know, um, you have a really great in-home service support parents are able to be highly involved or the client is super high functioning. Like I haven't been able to participate in it. I haven't found a, an opportunity to participate in it yet. 
Yeah, I agree. It's really, really dramatically inappropriate for, for the people who are, are in our community, um, people with significant intellectual impairment. Right. Um, really dangerous, I think, for them. Uh, Cameron, what's the difference between a standalone trust and a third party trust? So um, every trust, uh, so generally speaking, between uh, all types of trusts, there's first party trusts that are established by the individual that are that is generally benefiting from it, right? So if I'm impaired, I receive a settlement, I re I'm establishing my own trust, that's a first party trust. Third party trust means that it would be established by somebody else, right? It's another loved one that I have. Within those two categories, there is pooled and standalone or individually drafted trusts. Um, so, um, I'm not sure if there's a clean answer for you, Jeff, I apologize, but, um, you know, first and third party refer to the legal ownership of the money pooled versus individual refers to who's drafting the instrument. Is it that usually a nonprofits trust document that's more general to fit a variety of circumstances, or is it more of a custom tailored approach? Um, there's some pros and cons to both. Uh, I would just state that generally speaking, smaller accounts tend to be pooled and then larger accounts generally are individually drafted um, historically. I think that's changing a little bit, but that's a whole nother ball of wax to talk about. Yeah. Okay. Um, hold on, we have a couple more questions here. How are professional care managers better at accessing funding sources and dealing with the government. I better than parents, <laughs> you know, better than what, I'm not quite sure what, what you mean, but do you think that professional care managers do have particular expertise at accessing public benefits and dealing, I mean, when we say dealing with the government here in California, what we're usually talking about is dealing with the regional center right, which is the agency that basically dispenses the Medicaid and state funding to people with developmental disabilities for various programs. And yeah, you really, as, as we all know, you really have to fight tooth and nail um, <laughs> for some of these programs, right? So I think this is an important question, like how, how do you guys advocate for all of these public benefits across the board from food stamps to regional center? Right. Yeah, I wouldn't say I agree with you. Um, I wouldn't say that we're better equipped. I think there's no one like a parent or, or someone who's acting in that role, right? Um, I think the difference is when it comes down to is, is to um, what it comes down to is capacity. And the, I think nothing like a, enough, there's no advocate like a parent, but we also have, um, you deal with kind of the same issues, different folks, right? And, and they they vary minimally, like kind of like you're saying in California, we have Medi-Cal, Medicaid, Social Security. Um, and we kind of just know what's expected. We have, like I said, different folks that we can um, have access to. Um, I think it just comes to, it comes down to your capacity and is this something that you can do or um, especially for successor conservators, um, is this something that they feel that is within their wheelhouse to do? But and if it's not, I think you're saying that you guys could step in and right. advocate for those benefits. Right. Yeah. And right. advocating for housing, advocating for you know right. supported living, advocating for this the group home placement. I mean, right. that's that's a big job. Right? right. And um, you know, when parents can't do it, it's a big question about who will. Yeah. Right. I'd like to just piggyback with um, you know, at, at a professional care manager, this is their their expertise. This is what they do every day. It's just like um, a massage therapist, right? That's their expertise. That's what they do every day. Um, <laughs> so this is what we deal with day in and day out as far as uh, working in systems, um, having those relationships within a system, having the, the time, the bandwidth to uh, navigate the system. And again, nobody's gonna replace a parent, but uh, for a professional care manager, this is what they're trained to do and this is what they've, they've studied to do. So there are benefits to that, certainly. 
All right, we're just about out of time. Somebody says uh, our main roadblock is expense. And this is not uncommon in our world. Um, it's very seldom to find a family that has plenty of money to take care of their kid for the rest of their lives, all right? That huge special needs trust, like that doesn't happen very often. So I don't know how to start engaging these professionals. Um, and um, I wanna say you're, you're not alone. Um, of course, this, this is very hard because you know professionals cost money. You know, there's different fee schedules. I know like if you're a trustee, there's a certain fee schedule. You know, obviously every trustee is a little bit different. If you're a case manager, you know, just doing day-to-day -day work, you know, that's different, um, it, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Can, professional conservators, again, a different fee schedule. I know that on your website, you probably post your fee schedule, right, Stephanie? Oh, you're, I think you're muted. Um. I don't believe it is on our website, but I'm happy to share it and certainly. Okay, why don't you guys provide contact information right now before we close? And if people have specific questions, um, they'll they'll know who to contact about. You know. Okay, where's the best way place to should I just type it here? Yeah, why, why don't you type it in? I'll I'll read it out. Everybody can we're recording it. it <laughs> yeah, so I had it on the um, on the screen, but I think we might not be sharing anymore. Oh, okay. So no, we're sh oh wait, it's on the screen. Okay. I just wanted to make sure you could see it. Okay. Okay. Look, I'm not even looking at my own screen. Um, okay, so yeah, there's a phone number there and it's 408 573 9606. If you aren't in California or the Bay Area, you might prefer to find something similar in your area. Um, and you might be able to find that through the resource, maybe. Uh, Cameron, who, what, what's like the central resource they would go to find professional fiduciaries in their area? Uh, pro, as far as guardianships or conservatorships, which we call them in, in California, probably the National Guardianship Association. If you're looking for attorneys, I would definitely uh, recommend the Academy of Special Needs Planners or the Special Needs Alliance. I just sent the handbook in the, um, in the chat if you want to take a look at it. Um, that will help you. I think generally, you know, the first step is really talking with an attorney, um, you know, and then I think from there you get a basic plan and you can revisit and kind of add on to it each year. Ideally, you're starting this now and you're building it over the next 20 years. It's not something that has to be all done at once. Um, yes, absolutely. And Stephanie provided her contact S Johnson, J O H N S O N, at goodshepherdfund.org as well. Okay. And I just wanted to say uh, it is true. Good Shepherd Fund has been in the Bay Area for over 50 years. However, we are not, Good Shepherd Fund does not exclusively offer services only to the Bay Area. We are in other states. Um, our trust services are national. And so don't hesitate to get a hold of me. I'm happy to, to, to talk about what you're trying to figure out. And if I don't have an answer, um, help you, direct you to maybe someone who can provide more information for you. Great, thank you for clarifying that. Okay, guys, um, we're at the end of our hour. I thank you so much um, for your time and for this big overview. And I know there's a lot of moving parts. It's really hard. Sometimes I have to go through and watch something two or three times before I can digest it all. Um, and um, it, it's hard, we all, all of us autism parents, we need PhDs in like, you know, um, adult care for our children because the system is so co crazy complex. So um, we really appreciate uh, what you guys do and um, for taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you, Joe. Thank, you Thank you everyone for joining us. Okay, and this recording hopefully will go up on the, on the site later today. All right, guys, signing off. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Okay.